Right, so hi, my name is Sharon Richardson, and I'm from New York City. I work as a reentry specialist at an agency called Steps to End Family Violence. I'm the reentry specialist there over the reentry program. Uh, I work directly with clients who are returning home from prison who've had domestic violence cases and who've been mandated through either parole, probation, or the courts to uh, come and connect with us to continue doing domestic violence work. So I do case management with them. I help them with their financial ability to be able to gain that again, getting their credit reports in order, helping them open up banking accounts, and things of that nature to be able to help them start their life over as they knew it, but you know, on their own now. Many of the clients that come home have done long-term sentences, uh, sometimes from 10 years to over 25 years, and they've lost so much. Even um, the whole idea surrounding having children that were very young when they went to prison who are now grown now and maybe lost a, a family member or two or three or four through death. Um, or just having family members that don't want anything to do with them anymore. So becoming independent is really a struggle when you're coming home from prison. And so that's my work during the day. Um, outside of that, uh, myself, I spent 20 years in prison for a domestic violence case. I came home in 2010, so I've been home seven years. And I actually, you know, besides the love and the passion and the work that I have for working with other women and paving the way uh, so that other women can make it, is that I started a, a food catering business. And it's called Just So Catering. It's a justice-involved social enterprise where we uh, not just cook soul food, but we hire formerly incarcerated individuals who love the food industry and who love the idea of giving back and who understand the whole aspect of what food does for people. And so uh, one element of Just So Catering um, that we've utilized that makes us different from any other catering business is, is that we do storytelling. And part of our storytelling at the events come from just inspirational stories about being incarcerated and the love of food and how food and people coming together share so much love and that's the reason why Just So Catering even exists. And the idea of being able to get a job in the food industry uh, and give back to the community as a means of giving back because one of the hugest barriers of being uh, uh, an incarcerated individual is not getting a job when you come home. So we want to provide that and Just So Catering is growing. We are looking forward to hopefully at one point um, having our own uh, cafe and possibly having a soul food uh, truck in New York City that does not sell soul food. Um, and having the ability of having someone who was previously incarcerated sell that food. Um, and then we'll be able to at some point uh, start a program that will be connected to Just So Catering through my nonprofit, which is called uh, Reentry Rocks. And in doing that, we're trying to generate a place where we can, you know, get enough money so that we can give back to those that are still incarcerated and send packages and just support them in any way that we can you know possibly do that um, and that's the real social justice piece of, of both of these um, businesses put together um, other than that I'm here in Detroit uh, at this wonderful conference because my boss and myself thought it not robbery to be able to come here and, and not just share who we are and what we're doing in New York, but to also gain more knowledge because we're very open to anything um, and all the stories that the women bring and sometimes heartbreak and hurtful feelings and realness that people talk about when it comes to the whole criminal justice system and the fight you know, under the administration that we're actually in right now. Uh, and it's a struggle for women, it always has been. And it seems to me like right now we're going through that even more. But so I'm here to support that. And that's the reason why I'm on camera. My voice is a little messed up because I have a terrible cold. 
but um, I felt it was really important to be able to share who Sharon Richardson is and, and all that she does and, and the meaningfulness behind my incarceration and how I didn't take it as, as something bad or a tragedy, but it was a gift given to me. Although 20 years of my life I spent in prison and my mom having to raise my children, but I came home and I'm making it happen and I'm connecting with everyone who has a voice uh, because I know what it is to not have one. And we're speaking for not just ourselves, but we're speaking for the women that have died to domestic violence and who are still incarcerated uh, doing time like 15, 20, and 25 and more years in prison. And we speak for the women who can't talk for themselves and tell the real story. You know, they always say about a story that there's two sides to a story and then there's the truth. Um, so domestic violence is a huge, big piece still coming into the fold and, and we're learning more and more and more about it as the years go by and we want people to know, you know, that we are hurting and that we don't consider ourselves to be victims and we want you to feel sorry for us but we want you to hear the truth about the stories and how someone even like myself could get involved with the wrong man, you know, or the wrong woman. Um, and end up in a situation the way I did and come home and not be defined by the incarceration itself but become a new person, a new creature uh, 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 and transform and walk into reentry uh, with a story like mine. As far as when I was incarcerated, I said I did 20 years in prison. I got involved with a man that was very, very abusive and um, things really got out of hand. He molested my daughter and beat my son and I have scars and uh, police reports and hospital reports to show everything. And um, I met this young guy who was a friend of his and they were running the streets together and we had a huge conversation one night and this gentleman took that conversation and turned it into something much bigger than it was. Um, I'm huge on responsibility and so I realized that some of the words that I did say to him caused him to um, get friends and have my boyfriend killed at the time. We're talking about over 27 years ago now. And uh, I came home one night with my boyfriend and um, with my, my children also. And we walked into my apartment and these guys were in my apartment and they jumped him and they stabbed him and they killed him. And when I first got arrested, I denied even seeing him. You know, I told many uh, misleading stories about the case itself, um, which eventually came out with the truth. And I went to trial and was convicted of murder in the second degree. And so um, my lawyers did whatever they could do to uh, get my case overturned, but that didn't happen. Um, at the time, I was a correction officer, and I think that they really just wanted to punish me um, because they felt like I should have known better and not reporting uh, what was actually happening to me and not considering the fear and everything that I had gone through. Now I know these things and this is what I use my story and my experience to help other women and I share this with other women to let them know that although you may feel some fear and although you may feel like you can't tell the truth because you're ashamed or embarrassed that it's important to do those things at the beginning so that you won't get convicted in court hopefully and won't go to prison and serve 20 years like I did. I remember the day that I was convicted, um, you know, they stand you up and the jury has the opportunity to tell you your faith, basically, and hearing them say guilty of murder in the second degree, it was devastating to my soul, my spirit everything it was like you know when people say like death is coming you everything just kind of like falls into place and you see so much happening and although it wasn't a death it felt like one like my whole life just flashed in front of me and i thought about my two small children being left at home and my mom already raising me and now she was going to have to be a mother again not just a grandmother 
and it affected my family in a, a horrible way. Like we depended on this lawyer to not let this happen. We depended on this lawyer to do all the appeals that would possibly get me to come home early. I applied for work release, I applied for clemency, none of these things happened. And before I knew it, I had done five years, 10 years, 15 years. Uh, while I was in prison, I did everything that I could do so that when I would go to the parole board, um, that I would get the opportunity to come home. I got my associate's degree, my bachelor's degree. Uh, I worked for the superintendent. I raised dogs in prison. We have a Puppies Behind Bars program in prison, and I raised those dogs for 13 years to help someone coming home from war that has a post-traumatic stress disorder. And I did everything that I could do, every program. I helped all my sisters in prison. Um, due to my level of education, I was able to become a counselor and, and run groups and sometimes do counseling in church and things of that nature. And then when I went to the parole board in 2010, they hit me with two years. And what that means is that you have to go back to the board two years later from the date that you actually appeared. And they told me that I had done all these wonderful things in prison and that it would be duly noted, but I was still a threat to society due to the nature of my crime. And it was horrifying hearing that. And I remember feeling so defeated, feeling so cheated, feeling so slighted, and having to tell my children now that were grown in the visiting room that I was not coming home. Um, my mom had died at my 18th year because she had just given up. She couldn't hold on any longer. So the only people that I had were my close friends and my children. And I remember praying really bad um, and saying, you know, God, what could I do differently that would have made this outcome differently? And behold, two months later, I got a notice and a phone call that I was going back to the parole board. And I was like, what happened? And they said that they had made some type of uh, technical mistake, paperwork, where they ran two boards at the same time, which was a board, a parole board, and then a board of, of where the governor at that time were allowing people like myself, who had never been arrested before, to be able to go to a board uh, and get out early. So they ran these two boards together, and they weren't supposed to. So it was illegal. And so they allowed me to go back to the parole board again. And when I went back to this parole board, one of the commissioners who was at the earlier board who really wanted me to come out, she was running that board. And she knew who I was and had heard my story before and believed my story. And that was a wonderful feeling because as I was sitting there at the second board, two months apart, one in which it had said to me that I could not go home, I was feeling freedom in the second board without them actually saying it to me. And one question that they asked me was, is what, are you, what are your plans when you go home? And the tears just rolled down my eyes. And I just felt so free. And that evening, I found out that I was going home. So May of 2010, I was released out into the free world. I walked out of Bayview Correctional Facility in New York City into the arms of my children, my dad who was alive at the time, my pastor, and all my friends, some of which who had gone home before me, who were outside waiting for me. And it was the best day of my life. And it erased those 20 years. Uh, but I knew that those 20 years came with a story and that I would have to be the vehicle to tell that story whenever I have the opportunity. And that's another reason why I sit here today telling you guys my story. So I believe that the movements that come together for domestic violence. I believe that the nonprofit agencies that come together for domestic violence, when we're all under the same roof, there is such a, a, a liberating freedom of power that, 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 that sits, you know, we talk about the elephant in the room, but it's the power and the whole element of, of being uh, able to, to speak with one another and share with one another and create a, a movement within inside the movement that talks about some real life stuff that could actually be done. So anybody could come and sit in a room you know, and talk about what they feel needs to be done, but it's after we talk about the problems 
we need to move over into that place of solution. And in that solution, we need to really, really be able to talk about what that looks like and who's going to do it, who's raising their hand, who's saying, take my number, take my email, let's connect, let's really make this happen. Because other than that, it's just another event. It's just another conference where people come together and talk about things and then nothing happens months later. Uh, so I like being there. I like being present. I like being a part of a movement, a group, a nonprofit organization, people who actually see the injustice and want to do something about it. I want to live in that because only God knows when my last days will be and as much as I can do even if it's just in telling my story or hiring another person for Just So Catering or running a few more people through my nonprofit organization, Reentry Rocks, is that enough? Um, so we really, really have to look at that solution and understand what that looks like. And at the same time, it's important for people to take responsibilities. Um, I'm huge on responsibility. And I was part of the Long Term is Responsibility Project that the Osborne Association in New York City had um, developed. And they were the ones who actually worked with me for about six months before I went to the parole board. And it was really important for me to sit in the seat of recognizing that a life was taken, although this was my abuser. Um, and I think that that's really, really hard. Uh, to understand when we're talking about domestic violence because when we talk about domestic violence we talk about all that the person has done to you and then when we do not leave choose not to leave have the strength to leave um, the fear that that holds us in that place uh, the feeling of can I fix this and it holds us there and then before you know it something goes wrong and then someone dies and then someone goes to prison or someone's on trial, then what? So we need to talk about that whole piece of responsibility and know what that feels like and put that into the movement and move forward. And that's what I do when I work with my clients. Um, and it's a difficult task, but it's a hurdle that I believe that we can all overcome if we just get on the same page and do it together. In the end, if there were words that I would want to say to anyone who's watching this, it would be uh, believe in yourself, follow your heart, and let your soul lead the end, whatever the end is, you do have one. Like there's a beginning, trust your instincts, tell your story. Tell the truth about your story. Tell it to people who you think you can't talk to because the very person that you may be able to trust may be sitting right next to you um, and know that it's going to be okay. Uh, the struggle is real. We've all gone through it. We have all have a story and a journey and a path that we're on. But I believe that I was born to go through what I'm going through. Uh, because if these things were not to happen, they would not happen. But because they have happened, I need to be able to find myself in it, find other people who are in it, connect with them, and make it happen. So just believe in yourself and know that you're more important than anything else or anyone else that crosses your path.